Uh, I'm going to speak today about Mormonism, and I'm glad that, um, that uh, we now know that, I'm glad that Mark mentioned that Mormonism is the fastest growing religion in the United States. So it's something that although you may not personally have much contact with, maybe you, you don't really know any Mormons or you don't have a Mormon family member, it is a force to be reckoned with, and I, I find it very important for Catholics to understand what Mormonism is, what it believes, and how we can talk to Mormons about our Catholic faith. And as Mark said, I don't intend to impart any kind of really sophisticated theological explanation. Uh, I don't want to give you so much information about Mormonism that you just walk out of here half asleep. Rather, what I do is I'd like to give you the basic overview of what Mormonism is, a little bit of its history and some of its major beliefs. And then I'd like to concentrate on two primary areas that I think are the most fruitful areas for discussion between Catholics and Mormons. And those two areas are their belief in the nature of God and their belief that they are the restored church. They believe in what's called a total apostasy. And I'll get into both of those subjects in uh, considerably more detail. But first, let me just give you a little background to how it is that I came to become, I guess you could say, somewhat of an expert on the subject of Mormonism. I'm one of those weird Catholics that kind of glommed onto this subject uh, and, and really got into it. And I got my start, actually, by picking up an anti-Mormon book that came out in the early 1980s called The God Makers. And I, I found, and how I got this was a, a, actually kind of a story in itself. My mother-in-law had it sitting on a coffee table in her home, and I said, oh, this looks very interesting. I'd like to read this. And she said, no, I can't let you read it because I, I borrowed it from somebody else, and I don't want to loan it out to anyone. And I think it was maybe a a slight bit of snarkiness in her tone of voice that made me say, okay, fine. So I got in my car and I drove to the bookstore and I bought my own copy. Uh, Fifteen minutes later, I had my copy, so I was able to read it. And I was fascinated by the story told in The God Makers, but I was also, uh, it was very familiar to me in terms of the tone. And the more I read, the more I realized this sounds an awful lot like a lot of the anti-Catholic material that I had been exposed to over the years. A lot of the same kind of uh, ad hominem arguments where you attack the person rather than the belief. And so that piqued my interest, not only because I was finding a lot of fascination with Mormonism, but also I found that there's got to be something more to this than what the Godmakers is saying because... There's so much uh, as a parallel in the world of anti-Catholicism where people attack the Catholic Church with have-truths and straw men and ad hominem arguments and things. So that was kind of the impetus for me to really begin to study. So after I finished reading The Godmakers, I began to read practically everything I could get my hands on. And I, I really read myself into a position of understanding the Mormon Church very clearly and that led to, during my time of working at Catholic Answers, that led to a lot of contacts with people in the Mormon Church at Salt Lake City and other places. I had the privilege, the opportunity, I'm not sure how to describe it, of being invited to tour three different Mormon, training, Mormon missionary training centers, uh, one in Tokyo, one in London, and one in Provo, Utah. The main one is in Provo, Utah. And I'll tell you, that was like walking into almost like a military boot camp type setting. The one in Provo, for example. I don't remember what the exact number was, but it, my recollection was it was maybe about 2,500 incoming missionaries, like raw recruits in the military. They were in the, the complex of buildings going through all the things that missionaries are trained to do, including learning a foreign language and also how to present the Mormon church's teachings on the doorstep to people who will listen. So I was allowed to sit in on some of these training sessions, and if you can imagine what that was like, here I am, a Catholic apologist, being permitted to sit in the Mormon Missionary Training Center as the Mormon missionaries, 19, 20 years old, were learning how to take Catholics out of the Catholic Church. It was kind of like during the Cold War, allowing a Soviet you know, officer to come into the Pentagon and watch how things are done there. It was a very strange thing. But it really ramped up for me a, uh, an intense interest in Mormonism as a subject, but also it enkindled in me a sense of urgency to try to help Catholics who are 
taken out of the Catholic Church by Mormon missionaries. They're very good at what they do. And I'll tell you some of the things that work to their advantage when they talk to Catholics a little bit later in my talk. Once I became what I would call an expert in Mormonism, the only Catholic expert I knew of, I was then, uh, I found opportunities to do public debates two different times with official members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'll use the shorthand term Mormon during the talk today. The official title of the organization is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And although some Mormons will find the term Mormon or Mormonism a bit uh, not to their liking, it is still the, the term that's accepted by the Mormon Church. If you go to mormon.org, for example, uh, you'll find the term Mormon used. So don't feel as though you have to always use the term Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They are willing to accept the term Mormon. They use it among themselves. So when I got to this level of proficiency, and I was finding myself doing these debates, it was a very odd thing. The first debate that I did in 1989, I believe it was, I was only about seven at the time, and I, um, <laughs> I debated a man by the name of Gary Coleman, and no, it wasn't the actor, it was uh, somebody different. Uh, Gary Coleman, the actor, is not a Mormon to my knowledge, but this man, Gary Coleman, was a, uh, a mission president which is the, the person who's in charge of all the missionaries in a given district. And he himself was an ex-Catholic. And so we had a debate at a large Catholic parish in Los Angeles on this subject. The first part of the debate was on the doctrine of God. And I was there to explain and do my best to defend the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity, one God in three persons. And he was there to defend and explain the Mormon belief in what's called the plurality of gods. The Mormon Church, as I'll explain a little bit further, uh, the Mormon Church believes that there are many gods, un untold numbers of gods. We only have to do with three gods here in this world, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but they believe that there are many other gods. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The second part of the debate was dealing with the question of the great apostasy. I told you a moment ago that the Mormon Church believes that it is the restored church. They believe that the total apostasy that took place within, let's say, 100, 150 years, maybe 200 years at the outside of the time of the founding of the church by Jesus in Palestine, that church, the true church that Christ established, eventually imploded under the weight of heresy and syncretism with Hellenistic thought, uh, the weight of bad members and things of that nature. And the belief among Mormons is that God became so frustrated and, and angry with the way things were going in the church that he simply withdrew the authority of that church. It collapsed in on itself. What arose out of the ashes was what we would know today as the Catholic Church. And the Mormon Church is the restored gospel that was restored by a young man named Joseph Smith in the early part of the 19th century. He was about 15 years old, the Mormon Church claims, when he received a series of visions beginning, uh, he had a, a number of visions of angels, including the angel Moroni, but he also received what's called the first vision, which preceded all the others, in which he was, uh, as a young boy, 14, 15 years old, wondering which of all the churches he should join among the different Protestant denominations in the area in which he lived in upstate New York. He was a, a very clever young man. He was very intelligent he didn't have much formal schooling, but then again, not many people had a lot of formal schooling in those days. But he had a kind of a magnetic personality. People were drawn to him, and he had uh, a certain charm that, you, that we'll discover in a few minutes uh, having to do with the question of polygamy. We'll talk about that as well. But he said that he received a vision of God the Father and Jesus Christ who told him that he should not join any of the other religions because they were all corrupt and that all the professors, as in all of those people who b belong to those Christian groups and who profess to be Christian, all of them are corrupt, and none of them actually has the true gospel. But you, Joseph, are the one that we have decided to use as the prophet of the Restoration to bring back the true church. And so as time went on, he was given a vision from the angel Moroni as to where certain golden plates were hidden in an ossuary or a stone box, in this case not for holding bones, but for holding certain gold plates 
that were compiled, almost imagine like a three ring binder with the large metal loops coming going this way and the golden plates as if they were leaves, they would go this way if you were to go from one to the other. And he was shown where this box was, according to him, and in the box on these golden plates, he discovered the history of a people that had been wiped out on the North American continent. It was a group of people known as the Nephites. And this series of golden plates, he translated, he claims, by the gift and power of God. There is a, a lot of sensitivity on this issue because typically one would think that he, the way it's portrayed is that he, through prayer and sitting down uh, at, the, uh, at the desk, and he would write it out in English what he was reading. But further historical study has shown that there was a lot of occultic activity going on at the same time claims of a seer stone where he would put a stone in a hat and then put the hat up to his face and the stone would actually light up and some sort of spiritual force was describing to him or telling him or showing him on this seer stone what the translation should be for these golden plates. And so he would translate them and eventually these plates, after they were translated, they became known as the Book of Mormon. So if, you, if, you, if you've ever wondered what is the Book of Mormon and where does it come from, that's its brief history. And it purports to tell the story of this group of, of Israelites, two different groups, the first of which came over from Palestine into what would be modern-day Central or South America, and they migrated in boats to this part of the world and settled there. And then there was another migration that occurred also. The first migration, according to the Book of Mormon, took place about 600 years before the time of Christ. Now, the key to this, and the reason the Book of Mormon is significant here, is that it tells the story of this family in particular that came over. And the two sons in this family were Laban, Laman and Nephi. Now, Nephi was the good son. He was the son who obeyed his father and was righteous and prayed. Laman was the wicked son. He did not do those things. He caused strife and, and problems in the family. And so after a time, the, the people who gravitated toward Nephi, they began to move, move off into their own areas of living. Those who followed Laman moved off into their areas of living. And gradually, two tribes of people grew up among those two families. Now, the Lamanites, as you might expect, they were wicked like their founder Laman was, and the Nephites were good. And eventually, after many generations and a large civilization being built, and all kinds of details about the civilization are given in the Book of Mormon, what happened then was there was a judgment and a punishment given by God upon the Lamanites. And one of the curious features of the Book of Mormon, which didn't pose any problems to the Mormon church in, um, in the mid, early and mid-19th century, but it certainly posed many problems in the 20th century and beyond, and that is that this judgment given by God was to take those previously white-skinned Lamanites and curse them by turning, into, turning them into people with dark skins. And so the Book of Mormon uses phraseology such as they were previously white and delightsome, but God cursed them by making them filthy and loathsome and abominable, and the sign of this curse was that they now had black skin. As you can imagine, that might present a PR problem for missionaries who are trying to, to uh, share the Mormon gospel in Latin American countries. Oddly enough, though, the Mormon church is growing perhaps most rapidly in Latin America, and I suspect it's because this emphasis on the dark skin is really de-emphasized. Now, there's a corollary to that that has to do with African Americans, and I'll get to that in a moment. But first, the situation between the Nephites and the Lamanites at that point got really bad. The Nephites remained white. The Lamanites were cursed and turned into, in, in essence, the indigenous tribes of Central and South America, not to mention Mexico. And eventually, this developed into an all-out war and the Lamanites followed the Nephites all the way up into what is today the United States, all the way up, oddly enough, into the very neighborhood where Joseph Smith lived. And there in upstate New York, in the Finger Lakes District, 
there was allegedly this huge battle in which the, ne the Nephite army was wiped out. And the numbers given in the Book of Mormon number their, uh, their soldiers into the hundreds of thousands. And it describes in detail the armor and the weapons and the, the metal accoutrements that they had. And all of these hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers, not to mention women and children, were wiped out in this battle and were laying there on the field of battle. Nobody picked them up or did anything with them. And it was there that Moroni put these records that he had been keeping in this box on this hill, which is known as Hill Cumorah. There's a pageant there every year held by the Mormon Church to commemorate this, this event. Um, one thing to take note of is that there are no artifacts to be found anywhere in the area. And one would imagine that with hundreds of thousands of people being slain on the field of battle with the armor and the weapons and everything else, that some of that would at least survive somewhere, coins, things of that nature. Nothing has ever been found. The Book of Mormon is fraught with many problems, and I won't try to develop all of them except to say that if you are interested in knowing how to speak to your Mormon friend or coworker or relative, be aware that there is a great deal of information about the inconsistencies and the anachronisms in the Book of Mormon that would be helpful for you to at least be familiar with in case the subject comes up. They refer to the Book of Mormon as another testament of Jesus Christ. And they believe that Jesus, after founding the church in Palestine, that he came to the New World and he appeared to the Nephites and he established a parallel church there in the New World with 12 apostles and with the same gospel. But oddly enough, here again, not only did the church that he established in Palestine implode under the weight of apostasy, but the same thing happened to the church in the New World, which is why Joseph Smith was chosen to restore the church. Now, all of these things are discussed in great detail in uh, the Book of Mormon. I told you there was a corollary to the dark skin, and it goes like this. The Mormon church teaches what is called the pre-mortal existence, and this doctrine holds that all of us who are alive today, everyone who has ever lived and everyone who ever will live in this life, was at one time in the pre-mortal existence. We were all there together. This was before Adam and Eve. And what had happened was God, the God of this planet, God the Father, Heavenly Father, as he's referred to in the Mormon church, he was once a man on a planet orbiting near the star Kolob. Now, I've not been able to find that star on any astrological charts, but the, uh, the Mormon church in its sacred scriptures indicates that this is the planet that he was living on as a mortal man. He was not a god at that time. And eventually, he... He rose in, uh, in honor, and he rose in his, uh, uh, his worthiness in the eyes of the God of his planet. And so when he died, he was elevated to godhood himself. So he went from a mortal existence into exaltation. This is the term that Mormons use when they talk about going to heaven. You and I talk about going to heaven to be with God. In the Mormon church, that term, going to heaven, or exaltation, as they would say it, refers to going to become a god, a god of your own planet. Now, this god, who is now Heavenly Father for us, he, with his many spirit wives, they, in a spiritual way that the Mormon church doesn't, doesn't really explain how it happens, but he, with actual sexual relations procreated all of these untold billions of people who would one day inhabit planet Earth. That's the premortal existence. And he held a council of all the gods, so the neighboring gods from neighboring systems, they all counseled together, and he laid down for them his plan of salvation. And the plan of salvation held that he would send Adam and Eve to the mortal existence. They would take bodies, and eventually they would commit the original sin. They would fall. And he wanted this to happen so that he could send a savior. And there was some vying among those in the council, but specifically the vying was done by Lucifer, who was one of us. He was one of the spirit children begotten by God the Father and his spirit wives. And he demanded to be the, the savior, and he said that he would make sure that everyone was saved, but he wanted the glory for this operation. Now, Jesus Christ, whom the Mormon church claims was one of the spirit brethren, a, sp a brother of Lucifer, brother of us. By the way, how many of you remember any of this? I'd just like to see a show of hands. The premortal existence, you, some of you remember this. I'd like to talk to you afterward 
fun. I don't remember any of it, to be honest with you. Um, at that point then, they, Jesus said, I will go, and I can't guarantee that everyone will be saved, but I will give all the glory to you, Father. And God the Father decided that Jesus' plan was the best. Lucifer became angry, and that's where the war in heaven took place. And so Lucifer and all of those among us in the premortal existence who sided with Lucifer were cast out of heaven. The problem for them, as the Mormon church teaches in this doctrine, was that they could never reach exaltation. They could never become gods. Because in order to become a god, you have to first take a body. So the plan involves going from the premortal existence to the mortal existence where we are now. You receive your body, and then you prove yourself worthy during this life so that when this life ends, ideally anyway, you would then advance into one of the higher levels of the afterlife, there being three of them. And the highest of all is the celestial kingdom in which exaltation takes place and men become gods. This is not available to women, by the way. Only men in the Mormon church can become gods. Now, don't panic, ladies, because you can be a wife of one of these gods and procreate children uh, in the afterlife, but you will have to share him with all the other wives that he has in, uh, in the afterlife. Now, you know, I'm tempted to chuckle when I say these things, but th these are serious matters. So, uh, as odd as these things sound to us, I don't want anyone to, to think that I'm poking fun at the Mormons. I just simply want to say this is what they believe. So in, in this uh, aftermath of the war in heaven, what took place next was uh, those who were on the fence, those who didn't take a side one way or the other in this battle for supremacy between Jesus Christ and Lucifer, they were the ones who were permitted to come to this earth and take bodies, but their curse, according to the Mormon church, was they were born in the Negro race. So their curse is dark skin. And there are far too many uh, authoritative statements by Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and the standard works of the Mormon church and various historical authoritative documents in the Mormon church that make this very, very clear. In fact, it wasn't until 1968 that the Mormon church modified its, uh, its teaching on allowing black men into the priesthood in the Mormon church. And what happened then, was, those of you old enough to remember, the civil rights movement was getting more and more powerful in the United States. And through, I don't know if I would call it a coincidence, but what happened was that as, at the height of the furor over the civil rights movement in the United States, the prophet of the Mormon church, he received a revelation from God telling him that now it's permitted to allow black men to receive the Melchizedek priesthood in the Mormon church. So that ban was lifted at that point. But previously, for all those decades before that, from the founding of the church in 1830 until uh, the late 1960s, no black men were allowed into the priesthood. Now, the priesthood, a word about that. It is not the kind of priesthood that you and I think about in the Catholic Church. There are two levels, the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood. The, Ar the Aaronic priesthood, which is the lower form, is administered to boys at about the age of 12 years old. And that's when they become of age to serve in the church, various capacities. By the time they reach the age of 18, however, they are then admitted to the Melchizedek priesthood, which the Mormon church believes gives them special authority to not only ordain other Melchizedek priests, but to also do things like go on a mission and go into the temples and perform work in the temples. Uh, a word about temples. Uh, the, the reason that the Mormon church builds temples, and uh, I, did, I did a bit of searching in the statistics here, are interesting. When I started doing my research on Mormonism back in the late 1980s, uh, there were only at the time, I think about 40 temples. Now there are 143 temples worldwide. There are 83,000 missionaries. And the Mormon church had jumped in membership from 2.5 million members in 1970 to now approximately 15 million members globally. Now, 15 million members by comparison to, let's say, the Catholic church is statistically insignificant. 
to compare 15 million to one or 1.2 or 1.3 billion. There's not much of a comparison there. But what's significant about that number is how rapidly it's growing in such a short period of time, especially among Catholics, especially in the United States and Latin America. Back to the question of temples. The reason temples are built is not for Sunday services. Uh, I, I've had the opportunity to tour two temples, one in La Jolla, California, the other one in, in Las Vegas, Nevada. And what I found interesting right away was that it, it's not what it would look like from the outside. The temple is a, an interesting, even beautiful looking building, but it's not one large room. It's a series of small rooms. Uh, none of them are anywhere near as large as this. And the ordinances that are performed in the temple are designed to be performed on behalf of the dead. So you and I, if we were Mormons, we would go to the temple for our own ordinances, uh, the most important of which would be the endowment ceremony. That's when you really become fully fledged as a Mormon. You swear certain blood oaths. You wear uh, a white costume, certain... Uh, I would say stylized versions of what happened in the Garden of Eden are acted out by actors. They also have now, instead of actors, they've got this on a screen that's uh, professionally produced. Um, you, you swear these certain oaths, and you go through certain rituals that incorporate you fully into the Mormon church, including receiving a special name. So all of the women and all of the men who go through all the temples on that day receive that name. So your name might have been Sarah, uh, the man's name might be Joseph. And it's a secret name that no one is supposed to know except for spouses. And the, one of the reasons for that is that at death, unless the husband calls his wife by her temple name, she will not be able to go beyond uh, immediate death and uh, the immediate aftermath of death. She won't be able to go with him into the celestial world. So there's, I suppose, an incentive for marital harmony there. But you want to make sure that you're um, well taken care of. The other, major, in the other major ordinance that's carried out in the temple is a baptism for the dead. Now, have you ever noticed on the TV commercials, the commercials for Ancestry.com and other genealogical uh, services? Ancestry.com is a Mormon-affiliated organization. And the reason that this is so important to them is that they believe that unless somebody is baptized one way or the other, either in this life or in the life to come, that you simply cannot progress toward exaltation. You cannot become a god. And so they take that very seriously. St. Paul talks about that in uh, 1 Corinthians where he says that they who are baptized for the dead, he's talking about, remember the place where he says that uh, if Christ has not risen from the dead, then we are the most pitiable of people. So they take the phrase there where it talks about they who are baptized for the dead, and the theology that they hold is that you and I can go into the temple and be baptized by proxy on behalf of those who have died. I went into the Mormon, geolog or the Mormon Geological Survey, I almost said that. Um, I went into the Mormon Genealogical Library in Salt Lake City, which is a vast, a vast uh, uh, resource for... The, the genealogies of people all around the world, and I began to look up certain saints. I found that Blessed Miguel Pro, the Jesuit priest who was executed by the Mexican government in 1928, he had been baptized in the Mormon church. I found a, a number of striking instances of people that you and I would recognize as Catholic saints that they had been baptized into the Mormon church, and the thinking is that if they are baptized by proxy in this life, then they will be able to get out of spirit prison. Spirit prison is where people go if they're not yet able to proceed toward exaltation in the afterlife. And don't worry, Mormon missionaries will come visit you in the spirit prison. So if you didn't listen to them when they came to your door in this life, you'll have an opportunity to, to listen to them in the next life. And chances are you will have your mind really clarified on this point. When you get to that point, you'll accept the doctrine. But even if you accept the doctrine from the missionaries in the, in the afterlife, you can't proceed unless you are baptized. So this is why the Mormon church is so um, emphatic on, on uh, genealogies. And I don't know if you, if you realize it, but if you're using Ancestry.com, and I'm not saying don't use it, I'm just saying that you're helping the Mormon church amass its database so that Mormon members can go into the temple and be baptized for your relatives, FYI. A little asterisk to put next to this as you're thinking that through. Uh, in the time remaining, I'd like to speak a bit more about 
the uh, subject of the gods of Mormonism and their belief in the total apostasy. These, I think, are the two most fundamental areas to concentrate on in your effort to be a good apologist in your conversation with the Mormon. Now, I got to the point where this, to me, was like, I don't know, the covenant, maybe, to Scott Hahn. I don't know if this is a similar parallel there. But uh, I really, really got into the issue of Mormonism, so much so that I would... I would delight when I saw Mormon missionaries in my neighborhood because I hoped that they would come to my door. In fact, I remember one day in particular, my son, who's now grown, he's 30 years old with children of his own, but at the time he was about 11 years old, I was in my office at home working, and he pops his head in. His name is Timothy. He pops his head in, and Tim said, Dad, there are Mormon missionaries at the door. And he had this look like, you know, a kid on Christmas morning, like he was <laughs> so happy. And I had, a, I had a big smile, too, and I said, great, tell him to stay there, I'll be right there. So, you know, I, I didn't bring my coffee out with me because, of course, that, that would not go with the Mormons. Uh, the Mormon church, by the way, does believe in what's called the word of wisdom. And so, as you may have heard, there's no caffeine, uh, no alcoholic beverages, that kind of thing. So, for me, those opportunities to talk to Mormons were prime time, and I really enjoyed it. And every single time... I would talk to Mormons, I would discover that in their effort to try to explain what their church teaches, there were two subjects that I immediately recognized as the, the ones to exploit, the ones to, uh, to, to zero in on, so to speak. The first is their belief in God. Now, were there time, I would like to develop this theme for you further, but just to give you the basics, as I told you that God the Father was a man at one time on the planet orbiting the star Kolob. He had a God above him who at one time was a man on some other planet. That God, when he was still immortal, before he achieved godhood, he had a God above him. Now, it's not just a linear chain of gods going this way, but it also goes this way as well. So there are uh, innumerable gods who metamorphosed from mortal life into exaltation or the mortal life. This is known in the Mormon church as the plurality of gods. And the terminology that's used in the Mormon church is that God was a glorified man at one point, and he became a God and he became more and more glorified. Let me quote to you from a, a sermon delivered by Joseph Smith shortly before he was murdered in, 19, in 1844. Excuse me. This is known as the King Follett Discourse. King Follett was a Mormon church member who died, and Joseph Smith was preaching at his sermon. So this is a, a widely attested, authoritative example of Joseph Smith's teaching on this subject. He says, I will prove that the world is wrong by showing what God is. I am going to inquire after God, for I want you all to know him and to be familiar with him. And if I am bringing you a knowledge of him, all the persecutions against me ought to cease." You will then know that I am his servant, for I speak as one having authority. I will go back to the beginning before the world was to show what kind of being God is. What sort of being was God in the beginning? Open your ears and hear, all ye ends of the earth, for I am going to prove it to you by the Bible. It's interesting, by the way, as a little side note. He doesn't get into any scripture beyond this. Uh, he doesn't prove anything from the Bible, but this is what he says. He says, God himself was once a man as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. He says uh, that God could not, uh, pr could not uh, create anything ex nihilo. In other words, God doesn't create out of nothing. He simply manipulates pre-existing matter into things like planets and bodies and that sort of thing. But he doesn't have it within his power to create something out of nothing. And this is perhaps the most important aspect of your discussion with Mormons, is to begin to talk to them about what you believe about God, that God is the creator of everything, and that without God, the true God, nothing could come into existence. And this is one of those difficulties for all the Mormons that I've spoken to, including in the debates that I mentioned, um, and that is that there's no way, according to the Mormon system, to account for how all of this got started. One analogy that might be useful to you is if you were looking at the caboose on a train as you're parked at the tracks waiting for the train to pass, you see the caboose moving in front of you, and you say, why is that caboose moving? It, it doesn't have the ability to move on its own. And your wife says, oh, well, because it's connected to the car in front of it, and that's why it's moving. Well, why is that car moving? Well, it's connected to the car in front of it. Well, why is that car moving? Because it's connected to the car in front of it. Now, it's impossible 
to have an endless series of moving railroad cars that have nothing actually moving any of them. They're all moving, but there's no way to explain the movement. The only way to explain it would be if you went to the beginning of the, of the train of cars, you would find the engine. And the engine would be analogous to God in this sense that God is not only uncreated, but he is existence itself. He doesn't need to receive existence from anybody. He doesn't need to evolve from one thing to another. He doesn't require anything outside himself to create or to, to do all the things that God does. And in my conversations with Mormons, when I, when I juxtapose the, the smallness of the Mormon concept of God, he's just an exalted man. He's just got a better body than you do. He's going to live forever. He's got more knowledge than you do, but he's still a man. And he's still evolving, as Joseph Smith said in the King Follett Discourse. I have found, when I quote from Isaiah, for example, you could go from Isaiah chapter 42 through Isaiah chapter 45, and you meet with dozens of statements there in which God says, I am the only God. There is no other. Who is like me? I do not change. I'm not like man. I do not go from one thing to the other. I recall one day sitting in a, uh, in a, uh, a coffee shop with a young man who had gone from the Catholic Church into the Mormon Church, and he was very certain that he had done the right thing until I started sharing these Bible passages with him. And I said, well, how do you account for this? How do you explain the fact that the Bible says God doesn't change, he's not like us, and he was very quiet and thoughtful for a long time, and he says, I'm going to have to think about that. Now, I never saw him again. But I do have to imagine that even if he didn't have a rapid conversion, that thought must have really stuck in his mind to the point where eventually, at some point, it would have its opportunity to, uh, to be juxtaposed against the Mormon church's teaching of the plurality of gods. I'd like to talk to you briefly also about the great apostasy. This is key. Uh, the great apostasy theory holds that when the church imploded and there was no more true church on earth, that the Catholic church being this um, the satanic counterfeit religion, that it is the main opposition to the true church. Now, I found that perhaps the easiest way to counter this argument when you're talking to Mormon missionaries is to go through some of the biblical data. Let's do that now. Uh, the first verse that should come to your mind is in Jesus, in, in, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 18, where Jesus says that he will build this church on the rock of Peter. He says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is one of similar statements. You see it again in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20 in the Great Commission, where Jesus says, behold, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age, or maybe more literally, even until the end of the world. So you can begin using these statements and saying, now Jesus promised that nobody and nothing would be able to uh, destroy the church. So how is it that there can be an actual apostasy of the church when Jesus promised otherwise? Now, what I have found is a lot of times there will be, well, he didn't mean that in an absolute way, or he didn't mean that, you know, there's kind of a rationalization. But every time that I've said, I don't find it in any way ambiguous, this is what Jesus promised, I believe it, why don't you believe that? And it's a very difficult question for Mormon missionaries to answer, at least in my experiences with them. Uh, they have a difficult time with it. Uh, one of the 12 apostles of the Mormon church, James Talmadge, he wrote, quote, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints proclaims the restoration of the gospel and reestablishment of the church as of old. In this, the dispensation of the fullness of times, such restoration and reestablishment with the modern bestowal of the holy priesthood would be unnecessary and indeed impossible had the church of Christ continued among men with unbroken succession of priesthood and power since the meridian of time. In other words, the time of Christ. They believe that we are in the latter days, the meridian of time would be the time of Jesus, and then the beginning would be Adam and Eve. So that's a very frank admission that if the idea of the great apostasy is not true, then Mormonism has no legs to stand on. They themselves will admit that. He goes on. The restored church affirms that a general apostasy develops during and after the apostolic period and that the primitive church lost its power, authority, and grace as a divine institution and degenerated into an earthly organization only. The significance and importance of this apostasy as a condition precedent to the reestablishment of the church in modern times is obvious. 
if the alleged, these are my words now, if the alleged apostasy of the primitive church was not a reality, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not a divine institution. So it's my view then that what we should say is that this is really the deciding factor. Let's talk about the apostasy. And if the Mormon missionaries want to talk about other things, I would say, let's get to those down the road. But first, let's talk about the apostasy. And what you'll find is they will quote about six or eight passages from the Holy Bible in the New Testament. I'll give you several of them, which talk about a great falling away. Many will fall away. Grievous wolves will enter in. There will be dissensions. There will be heresies and things. You'll find these, for example, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 12. Mark chapter 13, verses 21 through 23. A parallel passage is in Luke 21, verses 7 through 8. Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 30. And some of the more specifically important ones are 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. And also 2 Timothy 4, excuse me, 2 Timothy, uh, yes, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, and Jude, verses 17 through 19. All of these passages describe a falling away, either of greater or, or lesser proportions, but you'll notice that when they identify when this would happen, none of them say, first of all, that there will be a complete apostasy, Jesus himself said there can't be a complete apostasy. I will be with you always until the end of the world. I'll build my church on this rock. Not even the gates of hell will be, be able to prevail against it. But when they identify a time frame, it's always in the latter days. Notice that. So one of the points that Mormons make is that the apostasy occurred very near to what they call the meridian of time when Jesus Christ was alive. The latter days is when Joseph Smith arrives. That's why he called the church the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He believed that his generation would see the end of the world. So one of the questions I've asked missionaries is, well, doesn't it seem to suggest that this apostasy was going to take place in the latter days? How do you know that your church is not part of that apostasy? How do you know that the Mormon church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is not part of that description there? In addition to the verses that I, always, I already mentioned, let me give you a few others that will help bolster your claim that there was no total apostasy. In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, The Father will give you another advocate to be with you always. The advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have told you. That's John 14, 26. And in John 16, 13, the Lord says, but when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. No indication that there's going to be a deviation from the truth. Uh, here are a few other things that we can talk about with regard to uh, the issue of the integrity of the church. For example, uh, Jesus said in uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 28 through 30, I love using this passage. He says, which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion. Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlookers should laugh at him and say, this one began to build but did not have the resources to finish. So I'll read that passage and I'll say to the missionaries, doesn't that sound a lot like the Jesus you believe in? That he started two churches and neither one of them could be completed, even though he promised that they would be completed, even though he promised he would be with them until the end of time, here Jesus says that, that that kind of person will be laughed at because he starts something that he can't finish. That's not the Jesus I believe in. That's not the Jesus I see in the Holy Bible. Why would you believe in a Jesus that can't keep his promises? Those are powerful questions, and I've seen uh, on the, the look on their faces that it really does penetrate. How about this one? In John chapter 14, Actually, I just read that a moment ago. Uh, the one I didn't read to you is in John chapter 14, verse 18. Jesus says, You know it because it remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. This is another powerful verse that you can share to point out, listen, as a Catholic, I believe Jesus 
teaching. He says, I will not leave you orphans. If the great apostasy theory is true, then Jesus was either lying or he didn't know what he was talking about because he promised he wouldn't leave us orphans. But if the apostasy happened, that's exactly what happened. He did leave us orphans for some 1,700 years until Joseph Smith came along. Or how about this one? In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3.15, we read that the church is the household and the pillar of truth. Is the household of God, excuse me, and the pillar of truth. You might want to quote that verse first. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. The church is the household of God and the pillar and foundation of truth. And then you can point out what Jesus said in Mark chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 12. He says, no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless first he ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house. Now, the traditional understanding of these passages, Mark 3.27 and Matthew 12.29, is that the devil is the strong man, so to speak, and Christ is stronger. He comes into the world, and he binds the devil, and he plunders his house. In other words, he gets us out of, the, of our domination under the devil. That's the, t the traditional understanding of this passage. But it works very effectively in reverse. And what I've done is I've said, now, if the total apostasy theory is true, then Jesus is the strong man and the devil is stronger than Jesus. Because the devil, in essence, then plundered the household of God. And he would, in order to do so, he would have to first bind the strong man, which I do not believe. I'm going to finish on a on an an, on an up note, and that is a story that happened to me with regard to a man I knew. He was a Catholic priest in Brooklyn. His name was uh, Isaiah Bennett. And the interesting thing about Isaiah was that as a parish priest in Brooklyn, New York, he too was very interested in Mormonism, and he called me when I was working at Catholic Answers. This would have been around 1991 or so, and he asked if I would come to his parish to give a weekend seminar on Mormonism because a lot of his parishioners were being siphoned off by Mormon missionaries. So I said, sure, I'll come out. I went out, spent the weekend, gave a bunch of talks on the Mormon church, and we went out and had dinner that Saturday evening, and I re really was impressed by his knowledge of Mormonism. I found him a kindred spirit in that regard. And then I went back to California, and as these things typically happen, we didn't stay in touch. And maybe, I don't know, uh, two, three years went by, and a Mormon fellow that I knew in Los Angeles called me up very excited one afternoon. He said, you'll never guess who came and spoke at our Mormon church this past Sunday. It's somebody you know. And I said, who? He said, his name's Isaiah Bennett, and he says he knows you. And I said, yeah, I know Isaiah Bennett, but the only one I know is a priest back on Long Island, or you know, excuse me, in, in Brooklyn. And he says, that's the same guy, except he's not a priest anymore, and he's not a Catholic anymore. He left the Catholic Church, and he became Mormon. And now he's kind of like our Scott Hahn. I remember him saying that. He's like, our Scott Hahn. I hope Scott's not here. I hope he didn't hear that, yeah. And so Isaiah Bennett was making the rounds, giving uh, talks at Mormon churches about how he left the darkness of the Catholic Church and came into Mormonism. And he had cassette tapes, and he was becoming a, something of a celebrity in the Mormon church. So the, the Mormon guy said very excitedly, he said, here's Isaiah's phone number. He's living up near Salt Lake City now, and he would like to talk to you. And he gave me his phone number. And now as he's giving it to me, I'm feeling terrible. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. I went to his parish to inoculate his people against Mormonism, and he became a Mormon. Okay, what, that's not going on my resume ever. You know. <laughs> what a failure I was as an apologist. That The priest himself became a Mormon. I couldn't believe it. So I'm writing down his phone number, and I'm realizing what's happening. And I knew that this Mormon guy was, was gleefully wanting me to contact Isaiah because he's thinking, okay, first we got Isaiah Bennett. Then we'll get Patrick Madrid. Then we'll get Jeff Cavins. Then we'll get Scott Hahn. You know, and, and they were just you know, thinking ahead a few moves down the road. So I was truly heartbroken. I felt terrible, and I didn't want to talk to Isaiah. I thought, well, I'll, I'll get around to it next, you know, the next day or two. And as I was getting ready to leave my office uh, later in the day to go home, the phone kept ringing and ringing. And I didn't want to talk to anybody because I was so depressed. So it kept going to voicemail. And I didn't give a, a second thought. But this person was trying to get a hold of me. I just didn't want to talk. So I went home. The following morning, I got this slip of paper out of my pocket where I had written Isaiah Bennett's phone number down. And I thought, well, I might as well get this over with. I dialed the number. And sure enough, I could recognize his voice. And he said, hello. I said, hello, Isaiah. This is Pat Madrid. Uh, 
And there was a pause for several seconds. And then he said, um, you weren't supposed to call me. And I said, I, what do you mean? I said, I was told to call you. And I told him about the man in Los Angeles who called and gave me his number. He said, yeah, I know. He was real excited when he found out that I knew you, so I gave him my number. But then I started thinking about it, and I called him back, and I told him, tell Patrick not to call me because we had a nice, you know, we had a nice uh we had a nice acquaintance in, in uh, New York when he came out to visit, and I don't want to ruin that. And I don't want to have a confrontation with him. I don't want to have an argument with him. So call him up and tell him not to call me. So that's what I found out on Monday was that he was frantically trying to reach me to tell me, don't call Isaiah Bennett. But I didn't get the message. Honestly, I didn't get the message. So I said, well, I'm sorry I didn't get the message, and, and if you don't want to talk, I'll understand. He said, nah, it's okay. Let's go ahead and talk. So we wound up talking for well over an hour. And I felt even worse when the conversation was over because he seemed so confident and nothing I said seemed to really put a dent in him at all. I thought all of his arguments were very weak, but nothing I said seemed to make any kind of impression upon him. So when I hung up the phone, I felt even worse than I did at the beginning and I thought, okay, well this is really a number one failure for me. So I thought I would just chalk it up to, uh, you know, I need to learn better how to talk about these matters and put it out of my mind. About six months later, Isaiah calls at my house on a Saturday, and he says, uh, I really need to talk to you if you have a few minutes. I said, okay. And I'm thinking, okay, he wants round two, so I better be ready. And he said, I want you to be the first one to know that I've come back to the Catholic Church. Now, thanks be to God. Here's what happened, and with this, I'll wrap things up. He said, do you remember that question you asked me when we talked six months ago? I said, I asked you 30 questions. I can't remember which one I asked you. He says, no, there was one in particular. He said, the question was, Isaiah, you're a Catholic priest. How could you turn your back on Christ in the Eucharist? And he said, when I, when I told him that, when I asked him that question, he said, in his mind, he's thinking, I don't believe in that stuff anymore. I don't believe in the Eucharist. That's all hocus pocus. I don't believe in that. I'm a Mormon now. But he said it agitated him, and it really began to work on him, and he began thinking about it, and he, just, he described how there were times when he couldn't get this thought out of his mind. One time he was woken up out of a deep sleep. Why did I turn my back on Christ in the Eucharist? And eventually, it took months and months and months, but eventually that led to a series of many other things that contributed to his conversion. I certainly was not the contributing factor at all, but I asked the question, and the question is what started everything rolling. And this guy who was there, Scott Hahn, came back to the Catholic Church. So I leave you with that thought. Don't look at this as an impossible task. Don't look at the Mormons as an unreachable group of people. They're good, sincere people. They want to love God. They want the truth. I'm convinced of that. We have it. So the thing to do is ask a lot of questions. Give a lot of good information. Bear your testimony. They want to bear their testimony. You bear your testimony. Tell them why you believe what you believe. Don't be afraid to ask these kinds of questions because, as we saw in the case of Isaiah Bennett, you never know where they will lead. Thank you all very much, and God bless you.